Now in chapter 1, Jesus is called the Word, the Logos. The deity of Jesus is the paramount purpose of this gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. The things that are written in this gospel are written to beget faith in the heart of man. Believe is used over 100 times in John's gospel, and it occurs less than 40 times in the other three gospels put together. Eternal life occurs 35 times, but only 12 times in the other three gospels. It means that when you hear the facts of the gospel, you recognize that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that means that you trust him as the Savior who died to pay the penalty for your sins. If you want to open your Bibles this morning, we just concluded uh, Ephesians, right? But let me read some scripture here, our, our, our reading for this morning, um, just to kind of get us into a place of, um, of comfort in where we are right now, where the Holy Spirit can reach into our hearts this morning. And the scripture we're going to be in, actually our lead scripture will be Matthew 28. Matthew 28, verses 18 through, and you guys probably know these verses already, obviously, 18 through 20, where Jesus is speaking. He's speaking to his disciples and people that are around him, and here, here's what he says. If you want to open up your Bibles to Matthew 28, verse 18, here's what Jesus says. He says, and Jesus came. Now you got to listen here because this is really a, probably this is a major command, I think, for all of us as Christians. He says, as Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So then he says, Jesus, he says in verse 19, he says, Go. He says, go, therefore, and make what? Make disciples, disciples of all the nations, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on to say, teaching them. See, teaching's part of it too, right? He says, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded, commanded you. And he says, and lo, I am with you, I am with you always, even to the end of this age. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, Lord, here's the word this morning you've given us and which you've put on my heart this week, Lord. As we head into these days ahead, Lord, um, where we, you know, it's that time of the year, Lord, we'll be with family and there'll be some, will be some of these situations, Lord, where there's members in our family who are lost, Lord. And I'll use that word lost. We're now followers of Jesus and we'll meet people this week. Uh, and I believe, Lord, at this time is a great opportunity, only as the Holy Spirit leads, Lord, uh, that you show us uh, the path um, to lead people to Jesus. And in that message this morning, Lord, um, use the Holy Spirit through your word to give us that wisdom and knowledge to go forward in that. Amen? Amen. Because every week, right, every week I say, because this is why I got into this message, I was thinking as we got out of Ephesians, what, are we gonna, what book are we going to do next? But the Lord put this on my heart this week because every week I say to you guys, oh, you know, tell people at the end, right? I go, tell people about Jesus, tell people about Jesus. But really, I wonder, I started to say to myself, well, I hope everybody really kind of grasps what that really means, you know, just telling people about Jesus. So what that really is, what that really is, is, is your witness, your witness. That's see, the word witness. And the Greek word for witness is martus, M-A-R-T-U-S. And what that means, martus, you know what that means? Martyr. Witness in Greek means martyr. It means to testify. It means to testify. The word witness. Keep that in your head this morning. In the scripture in Isaiah, I'm going to give you some scriptures with the word witness in it. This is in Isaiah. Now take this to heart. But you are my witnesses, O Israel, says the Lord. You are my servant. You have been chosen to know me, believe in me, and understand that I alone am God. There is no other God. There has never been and there will never be. But you see, he says there, he testifies that, he says, understand that I, alone, I, am alone, I alone am God, and there's no other God, and there never has been and there never will be. But he says, in that you are my witnesses. 
You see, grasp into that. And then in Acts, in the book of Acts, it says this, for you are to be his, Jesus's, witnesses, God's witnesses, telling everyone what you have seen and heard. See, I pray that, that's on my heart. You are to be his witnesses in, that, in the book of Acts, he says. And then in the book of John, we see the ultimate witness here, John the Baptist, where John the Baptist is a man came, one sent from God. You could plug yourself in there too, by the way. And his name was John. He came as a witness. He came as a witness to testify, as a martyr, right? To testify about what? The light. What's that light? That's Jesus Christ. And might believe through him. See, we bring the message. We bring the message. That's all we do is bring the message. But you know what? This is the interesting thing. Jesus tells us these things, and these things about being a witness. And we use the word, oh, we're soul winning. We're soul winning. We want to be soul winners. Well, Jesus says in Matthew, he tells us, follow me. See, all we have to do is follow Jesus' lead on this, the Holy Spirit. And he says, and I will make you fishers of men. Yes, you, us, all of us sitting here in these chairs this morning. He'll make you fishers of men to be his witness. And then in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, he says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Always be ready. Be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. But here's, the, here's how he ends it, Peter. He says, That hope in you, do it with meekness and fear. Meaning reverence. Be gentle. Have reverence, have respect. When that message, that opportunity comes, he says, don't, you don't have to beat people overhead. He says, meekness and fear. And then in Luke chapter 12, verse 12, he says, for the Holy, here it is, here it is, for the Holy Spirit will teach you, will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. See, it's about the Holy Spirit. It's not about what you think in your brain. It's the Holy Spirit leading you what to say. That's what Luke is telling us here. And then in Matthew chapter 10, verse 20, he tells us, it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. And then in Romans chapter 8, 26, he says, likewise, here it is again, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. When you don't have those words, you can't think of those words. It's the, in that weakness, the Holy Spirit will lead you to be a witness, to be a fisher of men. Because he says, we do not know what we should pray as we ought. And that's true for us a lot of times. So I say this word, soul winning, and I think a lot of us get caught up in this. Oh, I got to tell people about Jesus. I got to tell people about Jesus. So I'm going to talk about this witnessing. And I'm sure that all of us at some point uh, who've ever had, I'll use that word to experience uh, being, and it truly is, being, have you ever been like, felt like God was using you like an instrument of God. I think we've all probably gone through that, right? And we're leading someone to Jesus Christ. And we'll agree. I, I know in my heart, that is probably, I hope for you too, it's probably one of the most exciting things to see another person coming to Jesus, isn't it? Isn't it true? When you see someone come to the Lord Jesus Christ in truth and spirit, through the Holy Spirit, it's an awesome thing to witness. Amen. And you see, you say, wow, that person, and speaking from your own heart, you know that person, if they really are truly receiving Christ into their heart, their lives are going to be transformed. And that's what I think the thing is so awesome about leading to someone to Christ, especially most of the time when you lead someone to Christ, they're usually probably in a broken place or they're, they need to surrender. But it's an awesome thing when that happens, you know their lives are going to be transformed. And it brings such excitement, I think, to us. I know it does for me, and I hope for you, too, when you see that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start this by saying I'm going to bring something I think is probably the most vital thing about witnessing, about being fishers of men, and having an understanding of what that means like when you walk out of here. And Jesus said to his disciple, and how to be, and I don't want to use the word successful, but to be a, to be a, a person that has in your heart that's always on your heart, knowing that if the Holy Spirit puts someone in front of you, you're ready, you're ready to witness. Like, tell people about what it said in that scripture. Your hope. What's that hope in you? And Jesus said to his disciples in, chapter, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he said, Jesus said this. Now take this to heart. If you want to open to Acts and underline it, chapter 1, verse 8, he said, You, meaning us, we shall be witnesses, and he says, unto me. See, it's all about Jesus. Amen? Hopefully, 
Do you believe that? He didn't say, you may want to be a witness. I know sometimes we go through that struggle, right? Because he says this also, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, there it is. When the Holy Spirit has come upon, upon you, he, Jesus says this, you shall be witnesses unto me. See, there it is, the Holy Spirit. And it's true. If you, and I, how, many of you, how many of you are born again? Oh, that's good. That's very good. That's very good. Because if, tr- if it's true, if you're born again by the Holy Spirit, through faith in Jesus Christ, you are a witness. You are a witness. I'll say it again. If you're born again by the Holy Spirit, in faith through Jesus Christ, you are a witness. You are a witness. In everything you do, in every... Listen, in everything you do, your attitude, the attitude that you take, the opinions that you express, the reactions that you have to different scenarios that you go through during the course of the week or months or family, friends, enemies, whatever, or the actions you take towards another person, right? You're witnesses. Everything you are in those things that I just described, you are a witness to Jesus Christ. Remember that in your heart the next time you open your mouth, the next time you are in a discussion about whatever it is, an opinion or an attitude or uh, a reaction to some situation, you are a witness. And you're telling, when you are a witness, know what you're doing, when you're speaking and acting out as a Christian, as a witness, you're telling people what type of Christian, what kind of Christian you are. That's what you're doing. A Christian. Whether or not you really are Christians, because a lot of times, right, don't you get in conversations with people say, ah, you Christians are hypocritical. Don't they say stuff like that? The question is this. The question is not, shall we be witnesses? The question really is, what kind of witness are we? What kind of witness are we? Are we good or poor witnesses? Take that challenge into yourself this morning. Because whatever we do, we're witnesses. You're getting that, right? You tracking? Are you tracking? No? Come on! I'm not speaking Swahili here. So that being true, so that being true, there's also another, and here it is, another aspect of witnessing, which I want to focus this morning, which is, how do you talk to someone about Christ? How do you talk to someone about Christ? That's kind of what bothers us a little bit. Sometimes we don't, oh, I don't have the words. I don't know. I'm in this situation. Should I do it? Shouldn't I do it? I don't know if this is the right time, Lord. I don't know. I know we go through those things. I know I do. I even had someone reach out to me in prayer that felt guilt, guilty about not witnessing. That should not be. We shouldn't feel guilty about not witnessing because I'm going to give you, like I said here, I'm going to give you something in this message that I think helps you because many of us, look, a lot of us are kind of shy, right? Some of us are shy. We're shy people. We don't like, we're not outgoing, extroverted, some of us by nature. And sometimes we're reluctant to bring up subjects that are controversial. And Jesus is highly controversial, isn't he? He is, let's face it. In the world, Jesus is highly, con- you mentioned Jesus' name. That gets a reaction one way or the other. It does. And we sometimes feel the world calls, what does the world call Jesus? Oh, that's religion. Right? Doesn't the world say that? Oh, that's religion. I don't want to talk about religion. Oh, no, it's not about religion. It's about a relationship, isn't it? Because this, our faith in Christ is a very, isn't it personal? It's, it's a very highly personal thing, our faith, isn't it? It's personal to you. It's a personal thing in our nature and who we are that sometimes we feel not strange about raising that subject because it's something that's, it is a relationship, you and Jesus Christ. But Jesus then says, go out and make disciples. So we have to really take that to heart. And most of us have had probably that experience, that experience where people have uh, kind of like, who's it? Get out of my face. I don't want to talk about this. They're not too tactful. Has it ever happened to you? Like people say, get away. I don't want to talk about Jesus here. So we need to begin with this basic, and I'll use this word, vital, and it is a vital factor to begin by pointing out, listen, by pointing out who is the soul winner. Who is the soul winner? Because in all, you think about all of the world's history, there has been only one soul winner, if I'll use that term, right? It's true. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the only, listen, the Holy Spirit is the only one who has any possibility and capability of winning souls. Not you, 
Not you personally, you're the Holy Spirit in you, you see. I can't, I can't overemphasize that to you right now. Because we're not, and I've got to say this to my own self here, we're not salesmen. We're not salesmen for God. We're not salesmen for God with a mandate. You know that word mandate, right? We don't have a mandate to talk to people about buying something, right? We're not salespeople. We are witnesses to Jesus Christ. That's what we are. We're not, we're not the one who does the soul winning ever. We're not. We just bring the message. And it means, first of all, that we don't have, you and I, we don't have the power to convince people to become Christians in ourselves. In ourselves, we don't have that power. No matter how eloquent you think you are, no matter how extroverted you are, and say, I'll get this person. I know how to talk to this person. Yes, if you're thinking that way, it's not going to work that way. So every attempt you try to, say, uh, get into, say, argue or reason a person into salvation, apart from the Holy Spirit, it's going to be futile. It, it is. It's going to be futile. Think of what I'm saying here. It's like arguing, it's like arguing with someone who's a corpse. It is. It's like a corpse. What is a corpse? What's, what's a corpse's greatest need? Life. Life, life right? It's life. And you may, you may think, oh, I'm going to read all these books and eloquent, lead me, teach me how to do the, how to have, lead a person to salvation. And you may read these books and you say, oh, you've got all these philosophical ideas in your head. That's not going to give anybody life. That corpse, that dead person, that lost person, all this intelligence that you have, you think you're getting through all this other stuff beside the Bible, that's not going to give someone life. You know, you may demand, you may say, oh, you have to obey the law. You have to obey the law. And the God of the Old Testament, you may do things like, say things like that, and that just, that, that almost kind of like pushes people away. It won't help. That person needs life. Just like he gave us life, right? He gave us a new life. That corpse needs life. And I know, we probably know a lot of corpses walking around right now, even in our family, right? That's why I'm bringing this up this week, because of what's coming up ahead for us in these ensuing weeks where, thank God, because what last year was kind of like funky, because of, I don't use the word, you know what. But now, we're kind of, hey, hey, we're past that. We're getting together with our families. And when we do, whether it's family, friends, coworkers, you know what? This great life giver... The Holy Spirit can do the work in those situations. Because I know sometimes we feel pressure, especially in our own families. You know who you are, whether it's a brother, sister, cousin, mother, father, uncle. We say, oh, I want that person to come, Lord. I, don't want, I want them to be in heaven with us. You've got to let the Holy Spirit lead. You've got to let the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is more willing to do what he has to do than you are. Whether you can grasp onto that. But he, but he does this, the Holy Spirit, he does it with the one of his choice, you see. It's the Holy Spirit's choice, that person that maybe you're talking to. It may not be your choice, and you'll know. I, you should be able to sense that in your heart, that if the Holy Spirit is leading, especially when he gives you words to say that you don't even, sometimes you say to yourself, well, how did that come out of me? That's the Holy Spirit leading you through this. He's the one that leads. Remember that. Don't put that pressure on yourself. I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to let the Holy Spirit lead you in those opportunities. And I hate to use that word opportunities, but that's what they are to lead someone to salvation. So here we go forward and we move through this. What did Jesus think about? I'll give you some examples here. What did Jesus say to Nicodemus about the Holy Spirit when he came to him? Remember, he came, Nicodemus came by night. He said, Jesus said, the wind, he said, listen, Jesus said, the wind, he said, blows where it desires. You hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it goes or where it comes from. I always remember when you first heard that scripture, you probably said, what is Jesus taught? What is going on here? Jesus means this, that the spirit of God is sovereign. That's what he means. It's sovereign. God is in control. He's in control of everything. Do you believe that in your life? Do you believe that everything you say, think, and do, lift that up to God. He's sovereign. He's controlling. He's leading. Jesus means that the Spirit of God is sovereign, and you never know where he's going to work. Isn't that true? Has that ever happened to you? Where 
You say, wow, Lord, how did that happen? I didn't even know I was in this situation and you put me there and the Holy Spirit led me to lead someone to Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. It's about Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. And you never know what kind of person he's going to choose to bring to life. You may think, oh, that's the one, that's the one, that's the one. <laughs> no, 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 it's the one. You'll know when Jesus puts that person, when the Holy Spirit puts that person in front of me. I mean, look apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. If you look apart... And it has to be the work of the Holy Spirit. If you look apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, it's, kind of be, it's almost kind of useless to try and win someone to Jesus. It really is. It probably has happened to you already. And say, wow, how come I couldn't get the words out? How come, how come it just, I just couldn't, I walked away and I should have said, see, that's guilt coming upon you. Don't do that. Let the Holy, the Holy, if it's the right situation, the Holy Spirit will lead and guide you. I hope I'm getting that through to you this morning because it's only the Spirit of God that touches and blows upon people, like he says in the wind there, and someone is prepared, then someone, the Holy Spirit, you know what happens here? The Holy Spirit is preparing someone, some way, some shape, somehow, to receive the word, to receive the word of life, the life-giving blood of Jesus Christ. And that being so, we have to always sow our seed by every water, as the scripture says. And that's radically important. And there's no, look, there's no harm, if you will, uh, in making an attempt in any circumstance. There's no harm in that. I'm not saying that. Uh, or to talk to someone with Christ. I'm not telling you, don't, you know, pick and choose. You gotta let the Holy Spirit lead. And there's no harm in the circumstances here. But here, learn to recognize that if there's no response, that happens, right? There's no response. If you've been rebuffed, and this happens a lot to us, you don't need to press the matter forward. You don't. I know we think we do, because we got to win, right? But that's us. That's not the Holy Spirit. You don't need to press the matter. If you're getting pushed back, if you're getting rebuffed, there's no response. In other words, this. Witnessing is not... <laughs> Witnessing is not grabbing someone by, the, by their coat, saying, come here, uh, and backing them like kind of into a corner, like get them into a corner and arguing them into faith. Have you ever seen people do that? I, man, that happened to me. That happened to me a couple of times where uh, I was at an event, and some guy was out in front of the church, you know, uh, out in front of the event, and he was going up to everybody, repent, repent, repent. And people were going, they were just walking right by him. He thought he was doing good, but... People were just getting like, wow, I'm not listening to this guy. You don't need to press the matter. Because a lot of times those type of tactics, what do they do? They drive people away. They do. Don't be forcing things on people because of who you, know, you think you need to do this. No, it's the Holy Spirit. Look, let me give you something. Let me give you something which may be a help to you. As it, as it helped me. Witnessing, right? Witnessing, testifying, is primarily this. The right person in the right place saying the right thing at the right time. How's that? That adds up good. Does that adds up to a, a good equation there, doesn't it? The right person, the right place, saying the right thing at the right time to prepared hearts. Prepared hearts. Hearts that have already been prepared that you may not even know about. And made hungry by the awakening of the touch of the Holy Spirit in a person's life. You may not know that, but the Holy Spirit's leading you to that person because they're ready to receive it. Let the Holy Spirit do that then. Let him lead you. And the, that will be, you know what that will be? That will be a, almost, a, that should make you feel more relaxed and more joyful about witnessing. Don't take it on as a, as a burden. Have, be relaxed about it. Be joyful. Uh, be, don't pressure it's a non-pressured environment, right? That's what we're told to do. Because you'll know, I think this, and I believe this, and many of you probably, have, this has probably happened to you already. You'll know you're in the right, you're talking to the right person in the right place, saying the right thing at the right time. You will know. You will know. Think of someone. Think of someone right now. Think of some of the things you've been through or experiences you've been through, witnessing. Think about the witnessing recorded throughout the New Testament. To see if this is true. What I'm saying is true. Take Jesus' own witnessing to Nicodemus. Wasn't that the case? He was, wasn't that the case when Jesus witnessed to Nicodemus? Nicodemus came to him because he knew in his heart he was the Savior. But he wasn't quite there yet. But he, something was 
stirring him up. It was the Holy Spirit. And it wasn't, it was the right, well, here's, here's what it was. It was the right place saying the right thing at the right time. That's what, and Jesus knew that because he was Jesus, obviously. Here was a man, Nicodemus, who was fully, he came fully prepared already. He was prepared by the Holy Spirit. You know, and you take that, you may seem like you could take a, how about this one? The woman at the well, right? The woman at the well. As you th think about that story, that was a case again where this woman was there in Samaria, by the way, a place where Jesus, that wasn't really his home base. He was wandering out there into a place where, you know, it wasn't too great a place for anybody to be professing salvation. But here was the woman at the well, and she was again the right person at the right place at the right time. And that's going to happen to us as we go forward in this walk, if you will, in our faith with Jesus Christ unto salvation. This woman, she was fully, she was prepared. She knew what was going on in her life. She didn't want to live this life anymore. She wanted something better. And here comes the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, right in her face. How about this? Philip and the eunuch. Remember Philip and the eunuch? And, and, and it, that's, just, that's another case of the right man at the right place, right time. Because here's the man, right, this eunuch. He's riding in the, this chariot, if you remember the story. right? He's, he's riding in this chariot. And what is he reading? I think he's reading Isaiah 53. I think he's reading Isaiah 53. And he's, the question was posed to him by Philip. What does he say? Do you understand what you're reading? Well, obviously, it was the right place and the right indication that the leading of the Holy Spirit put something on his heart to read Isaiah 53. A eunuch. And he came to Jesus like that. Obviously, the right place, the right person, again, the right place, right time. That's what witnessing is. The Holy Spirit prepares the heart and then speaks through you to say the right thing. You all right with that so far? And what is it? It's the gospel. It's the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, right? That's a beautiful thing to, to, be, in that, to be in that place. That's basically what witness will always, witnessing will always be. And if you start by that basis and go in forward in that, you put aside all false effort where you feel like, what's the use? You, it, won't, it won't bother you anymore. Because we're, we're, there's so much, we're kind of, I think sometimes we're overrun with false principles about witnessing. You know, you can get, there's courses out there about witnessing. There's all kinds of stuff. There's courses, uh, Christian, Christian sources, obviously, that treat witnessing sometimes, and I've seen this, it's almost kind of like a method of salesmanship. That doesn't work. Where the gospel is, you ever think sometimes they treat the gospel like it's almost like a commodity? And it's really not. Like contacting everybody, no matter, you know, knock on every door, no matter what, who they are, where they are, and no matter what their response is, keep going. Try to talk them into becoming a Christian. Come on, let's go. But that's basically ignoring the fact about the lost. Here's the fact about the lost. They're dead. They're dead, and they need the touch of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is more eager to bring you in touch with that person he's working with than you are. All you need to do is just keep an alert, and here it is. Keep your eyes and ears ready, alert. Keep those heart feelers out there going out until you get a response. It's not our job. You know what? It's not your job and my job to convict people. It's not, whether you believe that or not. It's not our job to convict people. Once we get it, you know, once you get it in your head, we don't need to get into a high-pressure discussion. I, I don't know. I've been around people that can do and it's kind of people, people really tune you out right away when that happens, by the way. It does. I've been, I've been involved in sales a lot of my life. And you can see people, when they tune out quickly, no matter what you say, it's over. You might as well walk out the door. And that happens to us as Christians sometimes, you know? We don't need to pressure. We don't need to convince. Answer every rebuff. Answer every resistance. We don't need to do that. That makes us find witnessing hard to do. Because I think a lot of us feel that. Well, this is hard. This could be difficult. I don't know the right words. I don't know if this is the right situation. You know, we feel inadequate. Don't you ever sometimes feel inadequate? I know I do sometimes, right? And especially in some situations. And of course we are. Sometimes we really, truly are inadequate. But when we're not 
We're not inadequate to talk about what Christ has done for us. There it is. Talk about what Christ has done for you. Not beat somebody over the head. Witnessing is simply doing this, sharing with someone by the Holy Spirit to listen, to listen. And even though on the outside, even though on the outside someone might seem at first indifferent, you can get beneath that. You can get beneath that. And you're going to discover this. What you have to discover, a hungry heart. Have this ever happened to you? You see, you can notice right away someone's hungry. They need Jesus. You can see it. That's the Holy Spirit leading you. You can get beneath all that. And that person wants to hear. And they want to hear what's happened to you. They want to hear what's happened to you in your life. That's what witnessing is. What's that called? Testimony. You all have a testimony, right? You all raise your hand. You're born again. You should have a testimony. Be willing and ready and able to share that testimony of who you are in Jesus Christ. That's what witnessing is. And I want to stress this one point for now. The Holy Spirit is the one who does the work. Is the one who does the work. Another problem underlying our passion for this. Don't, aren't we a results-oriented people? We want results. I want, I know, you know, oh, and I always hear this sometimes. I, not that it bothers me, but sometimes at these, um, the Crusades, they have these emails. Well, 7,200 people gave their life to Jesus Christ and all this stuff like that. I don't know. For me, I think that's great and everything, but I don't think, put those, put those numbers aside because really for us, those numbers are not, that's not what the important thing is. It's about who we are in Christ and telling people our story. That's what it's about. And then Jesus does the rest. The Holy Spirit does the rest. You know, it's, it's not about like, oh, I'm the best, I'm the number one salesman for Jesus Christ. I don't know if that's really kind of the way to approach all this. But look, we're living in this world. We see so many different things going on in this world. We're, we're, if, especially if you watch TV, you get commercials or radio, all these different things, internet. And there's only, you know, everything's being sold to us, isn't it? Everything's being sold to us from whatever you can think of. We're always getting bombarded with selling things. So naturally, that almost kind of gets ingrained. Well, if you buy something, if someone sells something to you, buy it, oh, you won. That person is one, but that's not, the, that's not the, the dynamic we're talking about here. There's some teachers that actually use evangelism, and it does become like almost a matter of salesmanship. You've seen that? You say, wow, that guy, oh, that guy, he can really speak. The, he can tell, oh, well, he's eloquent. He can really profess salvation message in a way that, how do you know how many people he's reaching just because he's speaking so eloquently and intelligently? You don't know, but it sounds good, though, doesn't it? It does. It sounds good. So we have to look at a whole different set of needs here. We're responsible to get the knowledge of the good news, because that's what it is, the gospel to every person. It is true. That's important. But the Holy Spirit has not been at work. In a, if the Holy Spirit's not been at work in a person's heart, he's not going to be born again. He's not going to have a faith that's saving. And he's going to have a false hope. All over the world right now, there's numbers... In, I couldn't even tell you how many numbers of people who are on guard right now against the gospel. I don't know for what reason. It's because of this time we're in, I think, the darkness that's all around us. Because they've passed through, and some people are in that, they're defensive because they've had bad experiences with people trying to beat them over the head, sell them something. And they've had, you know, you, how many times have we gone through a, a sales process and you say, oh, here I got to deal with the salesman. They're going to... Give me all the hype and everything. You don't want to be that person because it naturally brings up something negative. So look, if you're a Christian, you're trying to put on this, and, and this you got to watch too, you're trying to put on this like, oh, this great victorious front to attract people to Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, you, you smile and you say, you know, you say all the right things and you're supposed, because you're supposed to be joyful as a Christian. You try to be Christ-like. Don't let that be a technique. Let it be. You attract people to Christ by who you are in Christ, through the Holy Spirit. And you know what? Has it ever dawned on you that, the, and I'll use this word, essence of witnessing, a big part of evangelism, evangelism is just honesty. Plain honesty. That's all. You don't have to make up. Just being honest. Being honest. And you know, really, truly, that honesty is about love, the love of Jesus and what he's done for you. That's truly being honest. If you really want to be honest, that's the only reason why we're sitting here this morning. 
Because of the love of Jesus Christ. Amen? Because this, you are the salt. You are salt. You people are salt. And that, whether you feel like it or not, if you, you raise your hand, you're born again. You're salt. Jesus says we're salt and light. And you are to be what you are. You are the light. You are the light. God has done a work in your life. Don't, don't just try to shine. Let the light of God put there shine out. Right? Let the light of God shine out in your life. That's all. That's all. Does that sound difficult? It shouldn't be. Let your light shine. And that light shining demands no more than just being honest in who you are. Just being true to who you are. You don't have to fake being a Christian. Be who you are in Christ. The Holy Spirit will lead you. In fact, honesty is probably about 90% of witnessing. It is. It's probably about 90% of witnessing. And witnessing is not just putting on a, a Christian front, like I said before, to convince prospective customers. It's not. Witnessing is to be honest. It's to be honest, to be true to the God who has made you in your speech and in who you are in your day-to-day -day behavior. That's who you are. You see, it's the Holy Spirit. And I keep repeating it because you're going to have to, I want you to grasp this this morning as you leave here. It's not you. It's the Holy Spirit who gives you openings, if you want to use that word. And he's doing it, by the way, he's doing it all the time. He's doing it all the time. And our job, if you want to use that word, as witnesses then, is not to make openings, because the Holy Spirit's already making openings, whether we see it or not. That's why you've got to be alert and aware of people around you. But to simply find the ones that are there. Find those people that are there. And they're always there. There are hurting, look, there are hurt and lost people all around us. They're always there. And we sometimes kind of hide our real selves, I think, behind the front to preserve the image we create about ourselves, the way we talk, the way we laugh, our behavior in a certain way. And real witnesses means getting rid of the front. Don't put on the front. Don't be one of those, I always use this, uh, Christianese. Don't use Christianese or be one of the, a fake Christian. I hate to use the word fake Christian, but you can tell sometimes, you, all right, stop. It sounds like you're putting on a front here. Be who you are. Just be who you are. Whether the words you speak, it, it's coming from your heart. It's coming from the Holy Spirit. Don't be live, don't be live, don't live as a Christian in some type of falsehood, what you think you, sh what you think you should be. Because what falseness does and fakeness does, you know what that does? It blocks the light. It does. You're not, the light, it's not coming from the inside out of you. And you say it's difficult to witness, you know, with a little honesty, it's almost impossible not to witness. Because you know what Jesus has done for you. And given you the victory that when you take your last breath, this is not the end. You are with him in heaven for eternity until that day of the new Jerusalem when we'll all be together. That's the hope in you. That should be the driving honesty in who you are. Doesn't that give you a different look now than just this being like about a salesmanship job or a business type of uh, situation? The only witness in the world is the Holy Spirit. That's the only witness. And he's the one who's coming to this world to bear witness to Jesus Christ. That's the message this morning. And he's doing the work. We don't have to ask him to do it or plead with him. He's already doing it. He's already doing it. And our job is to recognize the one who is the Holy Spirit is already witnessing and opening up people's hearts. Just keep going forward. Put yourself in those positions. There are some aspects we've got to look at here and what to avoid and what not to avoid. And there's helpful passages in the Bible if you want to look that up. But if you want to learn, once learn what that great and central, and it really is kind of a central message of witnessing, that you're simply an accomplice. That's what you are. You're an accomplice of an invisible, silent witness, the Holy Spirit, in you, in you. Preparing hearts. That's what Holy Spirit's doing. He's doing the job of preparing hearts. You're going to discover this. I pray that you'll discover this, that witnessing is really easy. At, once you put this into practice, if you will, but you didn't make it so. Jesus did it. Always remember that. It's Jesus leading you, guiding you, showing the way, giving you the words, putting people in front of you. And that's the message this morning. The Holy Spirit this morning. And I pray that with you this morning, that you take that to heart when I say, go tell people about Jesus. Not you. 
the Holy Spirit in you, Jesus Christ in you, leading you and showing the way. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. amen. Let's pray to the Lord this morning. So we come to the end of the message this morning, and the message is the Holy Spirit. And that, I want to, I'm going to speak salvation this morning. The truth, the way and the life. Jesus Christ this morning. Committing your life to Christ, that relationship. Not religion, that relationship. And that's what this is about this morning. That's what we're talking about this morning. A relationship with Jesus Christ. And there are many people that are in this world, lost and dying right now. And I have to and need to come to a relationship with Jesus Christ this morning. Because otherwise, there'll be that corpse. That dead corpse. That when they take their last breath, that's it. That's it. They go to hell, not heaven. You want a relationship with Jesus Christ? Jesus says, come to me. But there's things you have to do. There's something you have to recognize. That first, number one, that you're a sinner. We're all sinners. Right? We're all sinners. And we're sinners. We have to admit you're a sinner. If that's you this morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ, if maybe even you've been hearing this this morning, you say, wow, I'd like to know more about it. He wants to know. You know what? He says, admit you're a sinner. That's the first thing. You have to turn away from your sin. Because most of the time when people come to Christ, they're in a place of brokenness, hurt, and surrender. And the first thing to do is just turn everything over to the Lord. And everything includes sin. Because Jesus... What did he do? He cleansed us, didn't he? He cleansed us with the blood of Jesus Christ. Turn away from your sin. Romans, Romans 3.10 says, as is written, there's no one righteous, not even one. Not one person. There was only one person that walked this earth that was truly righteous and sinless. Jesus Christ. Turn away from your sin. If that's you this morning, that's the first place. Repent. That's the word. Repent. And then believe. That's all. Everything is about believing. It's not about jumping through hoops. It's not about how much money you give. It's not about uh, all the different things that we've been told how to live a religious life. It's not. It's about believing. Believing in your heart. Jesus Christ is the Lord, the Savior. In Romans 10, chapter 9, verse 10, it says, If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you are saved. That's the gospel right there. You are saved. It doesn't say, you know, you have to do all these different, you know, sign all kinds of letters and have all kinds of affidavits and get kind of all these different testimonies. It says, if you believe with your heart and you confess with your mouth and declare Jesus is Lord, you are saved. You are saved. For it is with your heart that you believe, isn't it? Isn't it with your heart that you believe? Your head gets in the way. Your head gets in the way. But your heart, you believe that you are justified. You're justified through the blood of Christ. That with your mouth you profess your faith. Because that's what it's about, professing your faith. And then call upon his name. Repent, believe, then call upon his name this morning. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Confess with your mouth. Because we know, we know this. In John 3.16, For what God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever shall believe in him shall not what? Perish. Shall not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. That means eternity. Do you want eternity? Do you want eternity this morning? Meaning, when you leave here, and we're all leaving here, some sooner, some sooner than others. When you leave here, eternity is for eternity. Whatever that, forever. Do you want that? Do you want to live on in true, in the true way you was, you true way you were made? By Jesus Christ, to have that relationship, to be in heaven forever, to be together with brothers and sisters. Call upon his name. If that's you this morning, let's everybody bow your heads for just a quick second. If that's you this morning, if that's you want a relationship, you want a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you want, to, if you're tired of this life you've lived, just tired of, tired of just so much pain and sorrow and things that are just tearing you apart. You know what? Jesus says, come to me. Jesus says, come to me. Come to me. He's knocking on your heart right now. He's knocking on your heart. He, think about this. Jesus wants you. Jesus wants you. Jesus wants you as a son, a daughter, a child, into a relationship with him. 
If that's you this morning and you want that relationship, you want to turn away from your sin and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe that it's true, the gospel, that Jesus was crucified, buried, and resurrected, that's everlasting life that he's given us. If that's you this morning, just raise your hand. And you know what? Just raise your hand this morning and I'll pray. We'll pray for you. We got one right here. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. If that's you this morning, because that's what it's about. It's a relationship. Relationships are beautiful, right? Think about, think about it in your own life, about relationships that you have. Think about the most beautiful relationships that you have, whether it's with a family member, friend, uh, neighbor, whatever. Think about those relationships. We're talking about a relationship with the Savior, the Savior of the world, the Messiah, Yeshua, the Yeshua HaMashiach. If that's you this morning, raise your hand. You want a relationship. Ask for forgiveness this morning. Turn away from your sins. Asking Jesus to live in your life. If that's you listening out there this morning, send me a message. You can go to our website, ccberkeley.org. And go to our prayer. There's on our homepage, there's a prayer icon. Just hit that. Send me a message and I'll pray with you. If you want to leave your phone number, I'll call you. If that's you out there this morning. You want to pray together? Just leave me a message. And I'd love to do that. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, thank you this morning, Lord, for being here, Lord, being a witness, being our witness this morning, Lord, our witness for who you are through the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God that lifts us up this morning, that guides us on wings of eagles, Lord, in that scripture. I love that scripture. That you show us the path. You give us you give us the way, you give us the truth, and you give us the life. What more, Lord, what more can you do for us than give us that life over death? What a blessing this is this morning, Lord, to be with brothers and sisters this morning that raised their hands this morning and came into a relationship with you this morning. That's what it is, a relationship. And also, also, Lord, your children this morning that are sitting here in these chairs this morning that have come here because of what you did on the cross. Because of what you did on the cross for us. And what you're going to do for us, Lord, one day. When we come into that final presence, that supper of the Lamb, what a day that will be, Lord. And I'm so thankful for that, Lord, that you would bless everyone here this morning. That, Lord, you would bless everyone and give them through the Holy Spirit uh, many opportunities, Lord, that opportunities of hearts that are prepared, Lord, to receive the message of salvation. As we go forward in these days of uh, celebrations with our families, whether it's Thanksgiving or the birth of our Savior, or even into the coming year, Lord, of the things that you will show us and lead us and guide us until that day, Lord, that day of return. Or that day where you come and take us out, Lord, the church, and meet us in the air. What a day that will be, Lord. And until that day, Lord, we will praise you, we will honor you, we will worship you, and we will love you. In Jesus' name, amen. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten Son that he gave his only begotten son. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him. That whosoever believeth in him. That whosoever believeth in him. Should not perish. Should not perish. Should not perish. But have everlasting life. But have everlasting life. But have everlasting life. Now, how does God save? By grace. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, and you can write your name in there, I can write mine, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And you have here with the word believe, the little preposition in. It means to believe in Christ, means to trust him as the one who bore the penalty for your sins, and that he died in your room and in your stale. But the greatest love story of all time is summed up in these 25 words that someone has called a miniature Bible. 
the gospel in a nutshell. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life.